Yes, yes, Dr. Hanis, I can see you are here. Yes, 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 yes. So we'll just wait for a minute again so people can join. Uh, I'll just uh, give them a reminder. So then you can start. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, I think Dr. Hanis, so we can start guys. Good evening. And I welcome you all again to the module three of our ECG master's course. So let's start guys. Dr. Hanis, shall we start? Yeah. Please, we start. Uh, please just check, uh, share your screen and we will check. Avoid the voice behind because my house is near to church. So some uh, prayer voices are coming. Yeah. So I hope my screen is visible. Okay. Is it visible? It is visible in full screen. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Now this time the, the cursor is also visible. I cursor hope. is moving. Cursor is moving perfectly. Uh, the only thing is I don't get to see the chats. Okay. So I can put the chat screen here. Okay. Fine. Now this works better. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Coming? I can see the chat screen also now. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Okay. So let's start. Yes. Chalo. Um, good evening guys. Uh, welcome back. Um, today the class is about basics of electrocardiogram. So first let's revise a little bit what we saw in the last class. So in the last class, we saw the components of the cardiac conduction system, the SA node, AV node, bundle of his, Purkinje fibers, and uh, 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 associated structures. We saw a little bit about action potential, 
we saw how the impulses transmit we saw we we read about the cardiac cycle which was really important in the physiology because uh, to understand how these electrical impulses take effect into the mechanical contraction it was really important to know how the cardiac cycle works so humne wo dekha tha pichle class mein so today uh, in today's class we are going to see, see the basics of electrocardiogram theek okay? hai uh, let's try not to uh, memorize a lot of things in today's class thoda samajhne ki koshish karenge theek hai kuch yaad nahi bhi hota it's perfectly fine just try to understand the concepts it's very important to know ki uh, see everybody will be able to assess ki st elevations aa gaye st depressions aa gaye kya ho gaya ye ho gaya but what's important to know is ki what do these means these uh, waves whatever we see on on the ecg paper what it denotes aur wo kaise wahan pe aaya aur wo kaise wahan pe bana so that's all what we're going to see today it's a very important class i hope you enjoy it so uh, just pay full attention uh, Uh, the things are going to correlate with each other. So, if you start with attention, we will we'll be able to understand better. If your phone is with you, I would suggest put it on silent and just try to focus for your full attention here. Okay. So, with that, we we'll start. Uh, so, before we go into the ECG, let's see what the ECG paper looks like. Right? The ECG paper is where the ECG is recorded. So, this is what an ECG paper looks like. Right? So, it has multiple squares. कुछ समा स्मॉल स्क्वेयर समा बिग स्क्वेयर राइट सो दिस इज वॉट इट लुक्स लाइक वॉट्स नोटिसबल हियर इज दैट द ई सी जी पेपर रिकॉर्ड एट द स्पीड ऑफ ट्वेंटी फाइव मिलीमीटर्स पर सेकेंड ओके दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ऑलवेज रिमेंबर इट दिस इज द स्टैंडर्ड स्पीड यू कैन ऑब्वियसली इंक्रीज और डिक्रीज इट इफ यू नीड बट दिस इज हाउ वॉट इज वॉट द स्टैंडर्ड स्पीड इज ओके Now, what's to, uh, what's there to remember is that this horizontal axis, the x axis, denotes time. the vertical axis the y axis denotes magnitude okay so, so whatever graphs we see here it's going to be running here so this is going to be the time and this is going to be the deflection magnitude okay whatever the amount of deflection is okay so uh, the deflection magnitude is pretty simple every small square is 0.1 millivolt so the deflection magnitude is current right current is measured in volt and millivolt so every a uh, uh, small square is going to be 0.1 millivolt now what's important to remember is how is the horizontal axis uska uh, calibration kaisa hota hai so we know that the time is 25 millimeters per second this is how the ecg is recorded on the ecg paper this is what it when it comes to us the ecg this is what it looks like so aise waves hoti hain so this square which is shown here is one big square so one big square has five small squares inside it horizontally and five small squares vertically so the five small squares vertically will make 0.5 millivolts obviously right or jo five small squares honge horizontally so now we know that it it records at 25 millimeters per second so 25 this is five small uh, squares which is one square is 1 mm so five square, small squares make 5 mm so this is 5 mm so aise panch bade squares will make Uh, 25 millimeters, right? So uh, this is 5 millimeters. So 10 millimeters, 15 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters. So five such squares will make 25 millimeters, and 25 millimeters is one second. We know. So one second is 25 uh, such small boxes or five large boxes. So one large box will be how much? Can somebody put it in the chat box? If five large boxes is one second, then one large box is how many seconds? Try to be interactive. this class we're going to understand things so i want your uh, interaction somebody how much is one large square no 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 somebody said 0.25 seconds so 0.2 seconds venkatesh is right satvik is right neha is right so it's 0.2 seconds right 1/5 of 1 second so it is 0.2 seconds correct now if one large box is 0.2 seconds how much is one small box which is again 1/5 of one large box how much will one small box be anyone 40 milliseconds or 0.04 seconds correct so that is how it is so one large box is uh, 25 mm five large boxes is one second so uh, 5 mm which is one large box is 0.2 seconds and 1 mm which is one small box is 0.04 seconds or 40 milliseconds this is clear if this is clear we'll move ahead okay so what is an ecg uh, the ecg is a sophisticated galvanometer a sensitive electromagnet which can detect uh, 
uh, and record changes in the electromagnetic potential. So this is what it looks like. This is what the ECG machine in its simplicity is. Basically, it's an electromagnet which has a galvanometer attached to it. So uh, like any other electromagnet, it will have two uh, poles, right? So that so it has positive and negative poles. So this is the electromagnet. So this poles suppose for example is the positive pole this pole suppose for example is the negative pole the wire extensions from these poles have electrodes at each end so, so basically you're connecting some electrodes here like this and like this okay so the uh, electrode which is attached to the positive pole is going to be the positive electrode the electrode which is attached to the negative pole is going to be the negative electrode right simple so now these paired electrodes together constitute a an electrocardiographic lead. So in, when we see the ECGs, when we see the real, this is a, a, a illustration of what a of what a what an electrode looks like. So when we see the real electrocardiographic machine, we'll understand that two electrodes, one positive and one negative, which makes a pair of electrodes, will make one lead. Okay. So this much we should remember. When the paired electrodes are oriented in any particular direction. The theoretical straight line joining the electrodes you know, is known as the axis of that lead or the lead axis. So it's always from negative to positive. So in this particular figure, the axis is going to be in this direction from negative to positive. So horizontal like this. The theoretical line, straight line joining the electrodes is known as the axis of that lead. So if this two, these two electrodes make a lead, the axis is going to be this. Okay, this is clear. <clears throat> This is not to be confused with the electrical axis of the heart. This is the axis of the lead. Heart has its... Oh my God. Some construction work is going on in my top floor. Anyway, I'm so sorry for that. So this is not to be confused with the electrical axis of the heart. Okay. Heart has its own electrical axis, which is different. So a lead so placed will detect and transmit any changes in the electrical uh, potential which occur between its electrodes. So between these electrodes, whatever uh, changes in the electrical uh, activity happen, like it happens in the heart, which we saw in the last class, those will be recorded by this lead. Okay. Now, what are bipolar leads and what are unipolar leads that we need to understand? So any lead which has two electrodes, one of which is a negative electrode and one of which is a positive electrode, like shown in this figure, is a bipolar lead because it has two poles. There can be some le leads which have just one electrode, which is the positive electrode. And the negative electrode is assumed. So a negative electrode is somebody's raising hand. If you want, you can unmute yourself and ask a question if, if you need. Okay. Uh, uh, so. In some cases, there can be unipolar leads where one electrode is there, which is the positive electrode and the negative electrode is not there. So it is uh, uh, assumed to be an electrically inert, a zero potential point, which can be anywhere. And the difference between that zero point and this positive point is going to be recorded. That is a unipolar lead. Okay. Okay, fine. So yeah, uh, so these are unipolar and uh, uh, bipolar leads. Okay, so this is the basic concept of how the uh, ECG records potential. Okay, now we're going to see what are the conventional ECG leads which are used in humans. Okay, so basically there are 12 conventional leads which are divided into two groups. One are the frontal plane leads, which uh, uh, which are lead 1, 2, 3 and AVR, AVL and AVF. I'll explain why these leads are called so and what do these leads mean. Okay. And the second group is the uh, horizontal plane leads, which are leads V1 to V6, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. So they make 12 leads like this in two groups. Now the frontal plane leads are of also two types. Uh, one are the standard or bipolar leads, leads 1, 2, 3, and other are the augmented or unipolar leads. So now, first of all, what is the meaning of standard and what is the meaning of augmented here? So standard means that whatever the leads record, they just presented on the uh, paper. Is everybody able to see? Somebody is saying only I am able to see. No, no, we are able to see. We can see, Doctor Patia. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, Everyone fine. You can see, yeah. Yeah. So standard and augmented. So standard is something which, when the lead records something, it directly presents it, and that's a, that is a standard lead. Sometimes when the leads are placed far away. From from the electrical activity, like in this case, the heart. So the leads will, uh, as, so basically as far away from the electrical activity you go, the amount of signal you're going to receive is going to become smaller and smaller. So when the leads are placed far away, 
the signal recorded will be really small. In that case, the electrocardiographic machine will augment that uh, signal and make it big and show it to you. That And in that case, those leads will be called as augmented leads. So AVR, AVL and AVF will realize later that they're placed far away from the heart. So the signals they receive are really small. That's why they are called augmented leads because the signals are augmented while when presenting. And also leads one, two, three, and uh, and three are bipolar leads. We've seen because they will have a negative electrode and a positive electrode. We know what a bipolar lead is now. And uh, lead AVR, AVL, and AVF are going to be unipolar leads because they will have only one uh, uh, electrode. And the other ele electrode is going to be an assumed electrode within the heart, a zero potential point at inside the heart. Okay, so that's why they're unipolar leads. The horizontal plate leads V1 to V6 are also unipolar leads. Okay, so these are unipolar, AVR, AVL, and AVF are unipolar, and lead 1, 2, 3 are bipolar leads. Okay, if this is clear, we'll move ahead. So uh, how the uh, electrodes are uh, positioned, okay? So somebody's raising hand. If anybody has any doubt, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat box, I'll answer it. Okay, I'm going really slow today. Last time I got the feedback that I was really fast. I'm going very slow. I hope everyone's understanding. Time okay. <laughs> okay. Augmented leads rifa is uh, uh, any lead when it is far away from the heart, it, so basically what happens is whenever you place a lead somewhere, it is recording an electrical activity. If, if the lead is very close to that electrical activity, in our case, the electrical activity is inside the heart. So if the lead is close to the heart, it will, the signal it will receive is large. It's big. Okay. So it will, it will be properly shown on the, uh, on the ECG paper, but if the lead is, is kept far away from the heart, the amount of signal it starts receiving becomes less. So when the leads are placed far away, the signal is less. So the ECG machine has to, which we cannot see with our eyes. So the ECG machine has to augment it to show it to us. That's why they're called as augmented leads. Okay. I hope it's clear now. So, yeah. So now let's talk about lead one, two, and three first. So basically the, uh, we need to understand where we put the electrodes while recording an ECG. So basically we have three limb electrodes and six chest or precordial electrodes. So the limb electrodes are placed one in your left arm, second in your right arm, and third is in your left limb, left lower limb, left leg. Okay. So these are the three limb electrodes. Now, when you have three electrodes, so how many bipolar and how many unipolar uh, leads can you make out of it? We know bipolar leads is when you have two electrodes and unipolar leads is when you have one electrode. So when you have three uh, electrodes, you can simply make three unipolar leads out of it, which is very clear. Assuming a central zero potential point inside the heart, you can make three unipolar leads. Okay. And you can also make three bipolar leads. So suppose you have two electrodes, one is in your left upper limb and second is in your right upper limb. If you assume one of them is negative and one is positive, that will give you one lead, which will be one. Then one between the left upper limb and the left lower limb, if one is negative and one is positive, one lead will get there. And the third one will be the right upper limb and the left lower limb. Okay. This is also clear. So that we can see in this figure. So if you have one electrode here in your right upper limb and one here in your left upper limb, if you assume this is negative and this is positive, the electrical axis which you get between them will be negative to positive. So in this direction, from here to here, that will give us lead one. Okay, between right upper limb and left upper limb. Similarly, if you assume the negative electrode is right upper limb, and the positive electrode is a left lower limb, the uh, electrical axis which you'll get is in this direction. This will be lead two. So in this direction is lead two. Okay. Similarly, if you assume the uh, neg negative electrode is left upper limb and the positive electrode is right left lower limb, then in this direction, you'll get another lead. This is lead three. So these are the three bipolar leads which we have. Remember their directions. This is horizontal almost. This is uh, towards the left and down. And this is towards the right and down. This is going to be important. We'll see it later. So just remember it. Okay. I hope the bipolar leads are clear. Now we'll see the unipolar limb leads. So the electrode of a, a so-called unipolar uh, lead constitutes the exploring electrode and is in effect the positive electrode of the lead. Okay. We've seen what a unipolar lead is. We know this. The negative electrode is so constructed uh, that it is considered to be at the zero potential. There is no negative electrode. It is assumed that it is a zero potential within the heart. The exploring electrode thus reflects the true potential. 
All unipolar leads are termed V leads. So remember, unipolar leads are termed V leads and consist of either extremity lead leads or limb leads and precordial leads or chest leads. Correct? But extremity leads, we know, are of low electrical potential. We have already seen that and therefore they are instrumentally augmented by the uh, ECG machine. So that's why these augmented extremity leads are prefixed by the letter A. So that's why they're called as A, V, R or L or F. R for right, L for left and F for inferior because it's down in the leg, right? So that's how you get the three limb leads. Okay, that's why their nomenclature AVR, AVL and AVF. I hope you have understood the nomenclature also. And the other unipolar leads are in the chest or in the precordium. They are also termed V leads. So they are, they are called as V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 and V6. Correct? So four leads are placed on right arm, uh, left arm, right leg and left leg. No, there is no lead on the left, on the right leg. There is There are only three lead, uh, electrodes. One is in the right arm, one is in the left arm and one is in the left leg. There's nothing on the uh, right leg. Okay. In our ECG machines, there is one on the uh, uh, right leg also, but it is electrically, even if you remove it, your ECG machine will not be disturbed. You can try it. It's just given in the machines, but it is of no use. Even if you remove the one in the right leg, nothing will happen. Okay. So, yeah, this, uh, uh, so basically, this is how you get the uh, augmented limb uh, electrodes. So, you place three here. Right upper limb, left upper limb, and left lower limb. There's nothing on the right lower limb. Even if it is there, it is a dummy. It's it's of no use. So this gives you three unipolar leads like this. Now, the question which you'll ask is, if this is placed here at the wrist, why is, the, is it seeing the heart from here, from the shoulder? AVF, A is for augmented, V is for unipolar, and F is because it's inferior. It's lower down. That's why it's F, inferior. Okay. Okay, so uh, the question which I'll ask is, why is it seeing the heart from here, from shoulder? Why not from here? The axis, so because the AVR axis is, is, is like this, from negative to positive, it's going to be like this, okay, in this direction, from here to here, not from here to here, even though you're placing it here. That's because no matter where you place the electrode in the limb, it is going to see where the limb joins the torso. So if, if your upper limb here joins the torso here at the shoulder, the potential is going to be recorded here. Uh, Nasiha Azaz, what exactly do you want me to repeat put that also? Okay. So if it is recording, even if you place it at the wrist, it is not going to record it at the wrist. Yeah, that's what I'm explaining. This slide, I'm not done explaining it. Listen, even if you place the uh, electrode at the wrist, it's going to record from the shoulder because it's going to record. It is supposed to that the place where the limb attaches the torso from there it records, right? That is going to be the point. So that's why the axis of AVR lead is from heart to here in this direction. And the AVL is from heart till here in this direction. And AVF is from heart till here. So in this direction, I hope that is also clear now. Okay. Now the horizontal plane leads. So basically we have six chest electrodes, which we all know V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. These are also unipolar electrodes. So for them, the uh, negative electrode is inside the heart, the zoomed electrode. Now, how do we place these leads is important. Most of us know it, but I'll still repeat it. So V1 electrode is placed at the fourth intercostal space, just right to the sternum. The V2 electrode is placed again at the fourth intercostal space, just left to the sternum. The V4 electrode is placed in the mid clavicular line in the fifth intercostal space. V3 is in between V2 and V4. And V6 is placed in the mid axillary line again in the fifth intercostal space. And V5 is between V4 and V6. That's how the six electrodes are placed. This is also shown in the in, in this figure, if you see, the same thing is given. In this X-ray also, is the same thing is given. Uh, if you see, in the X-ray, some people might confuse that this is not the fourth intercostal space, but it is the fourth intercostal space. This It is not first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh intercostal space. These are the posterior ribs which you are seeing. The anterior ribs are this, which are difficult to appreciate. This is the first intercostal space. This is the second intercostal space. This is the third intercostal space. And this is the fourth intercostal space. So it is placed as the fourth intercostal space. So once again, repeat the positions where V1 to V6 is placed. Okay, I'm repeating it once again. You can take the screenshot of this screen if you want. Or uh, I'm saying it once again, if you want, you can write it down. V1 is placed in the fourth intercostal space, just right to the sternum. V2 is placed again in the fourth intercostal space, just left to the sternum. 
V4 is placed in the mid clavicular line in the fifth intercostal space. And V3 is between V2 and V4. V6 is placed in the mid axillary line again in the fifth intercostal space. And V5 is between V4 and V6. Okay, this much is clear. Sometimes there are posterior leads also V7, V8, V9, and there are right-sided leads also, which we can see later, which is beyond the scope of this. But first let's understand, remembering where you place the leads, what you do with that is not that important. Okay, that you'll find in any book. Understand how these leads work and how they give you a picture. That is uh, uh, what, what the most important thing is. Okay, so uh, focus on understanding rather than remembering ki kaha lagate hai leads. Wo to kisi book mein kabhi bhi bad loge, hai na? So samaj nahi kush karo. Okay, next. So what are the basic ECG deflections? So uh, these are the basic ECG deflections which we see. The P wave, the Q, R, S complex, the T wave, and sometimes you see the U wave. This we saw in the last class also. Okay, and now we also know from the last class that the P wave denotes atrial depolarization. The QRS denotes the ventricular depolarization. The T wave denotes the ventricular repolarization. Atrial, depo atrial repolarization is not shown on the ECG because it overlaps with the QRS complex and it is not represented. Now, this uh, ECG also shows something called as intrinsic or deflection and the VAT, which is ventricle activation time where will we place frontal one two and three can you please explain at all na? one is in the right fourth intercostal place just right to the sternum two is in the fourth intercostal place just left to the sternum three is between v2 and v4 so three ka location is not specified fourth v4 is in the uh, uh, mid, mid clavicular line fifth intercostal space okay i've said it three times now so you can later on see it in the recordings also if you want Okay, so these are the basic ECG deflections. Okay, now how these deflections happen and what happens, this is what is important to see. Uh, this ventricle activation time and intrinsic or deflection, we will see towards the end of this class itself. So just wait. It, these topics are slightly difficult to understand, but when you go through the entire thing, you will understand it later. Now, at this point, if I tell you, you will not understand, so we'll see it later. So what is the basic action of an ECG? Okay, so this slide onwards, a lot of uh, understanding is involved. So please try and focus your attention. I'm saying it again and again. Okay? So in the resting state, cardiac cells are deemed to be po uh, polarized. Hai na? Action potential, we have seen that there is a negative potential of every cardiac cell in the resting state, which is around minus 70 to minus 90. Pata hai hai, so they are deemed to be polarized. When the cardiac cells are activated, they are deemed to be depolarized. Correct? We have seen action potential. Mein. So, sequential depolarization of cardiac muscle tissue causes a depolarization or activation excitation front, which results in an electrical current. Hai? This infinitesimal electrocardiographic current forms an electromagnetic force or vector that can be detected and recorded by the electrocardiograph. Hai na? So, basically, cardiac cells are getting depolarized one after the other, and this creates a current, and that current is being recorded by the ECG machine. Okay. Electrocardiography is based on one essential and fundamental principle, which can be succinctly reflected by two statements. So understand this principle is very important. So whenever an electromagnetic force, it's a current vector activation front and depolarization front flows, or it is directed towards the positive electrode of a lead, the ECG records an upward or positive deflection. Okay, clear? Now read the second sentence again. Whenever an electromagnetic force flows or is directed away from the positive electrode of a lead and thus towards the negative electrode of the lead, the ECG records a downward or negative deflection. Like you see in this figure, this is the negative electrode and this is the positive electrode. So whenever a current or vector is flowing from negative to positive electrode, the ECG will show a positive reflection. And whenever the current is flowing from positive to negative direction, the ECG will show, will show a negative deflection. Okay? This is very So just remember. Okay? It's very important to understand this concept. So why uh, an elect a lead has two electrodes? To record the electrical difference. So whenever a current flows from negative to positive, positive reflection. Whenever negative, uh, positive to negative, negative deflection. Okay? So with this, we'll move on to next. Um, 
The electromagnetic force is a vector since it has both magnitude and direction. All the ECG deflections are the expressions of such forces or vectors. Okay? So in this last uh, 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 figure, which we saw that this is flowing from here to here. So it has both. It has a direction, the direction in which it is flowing. And it has a magnitude, the magnitude, the force with which it is flowing. Right. So the direction and force both are represented in the ECG. Right. Thus, the P wave, the QRS complex and the T wave are all expressions of vectors or electrical forces that have magnitude and direction and the same essential basic principle applies to all of them okay correct all of these waves which are formed is because of both the uh, the force as well as the magnitude as well as the direction if for example the qrs complex is upright in any particular lead it means that the qrs vector is directed towards the positive fold uh, pole of that particular lead okay so much more Conversely, if the QRS complex is inverted in that particular lead, it means that the QRS vector is directed away from the positive pole of that particular lead and towards its negative pole. Okay? This is also clear. This principle applies to all the ECG deflections, the P wave, the QRS wave, the T wave, U waves, as well as the ST segment also if it is deviated. Okay? So this principle is very important. All the ECG relies on this particular principle. Now the ECG significance of cardiac anatomy. It is obvious to say that the heart is a four-chambered organ, okay? Two atria, two ventricles, we know that. It is not often appreciated, however, that in an electrophysiological sense, the heart consists of only two chambers. One is formed by the atria and one is formed by the ventricles, okay? So, electrophysiologically, you can consider heart of, to, be of, to be composed of two chambers. One is the bilateral chamber and one is the biventricular chamber. So, two chambers, okay? The two atria function is a single electrophysiological chamber and electrophysiological unit. There is no electrical boundary between them and both are activated by a single activation process. The functional electrophysiological unit may be referred to as the biatrial chamber. Similarly, the ventricles also function as an electrophysiological unit which may be referred to as the biventricular chamber. The two electrophysiological chambers are separated from each other by an elect. So the two chambers, the biatrial chamber and the biventricular chamber, they are separated from each other by an electrically inert conduction barrier formed by the fibrous AV ring. So this is that AV ring, atrioventricular ring. There's a ring in between atria and ventricles, right? This is an electrically inert barrier. Area. This cannot let the impulses tra travel from uh, atria to ventricles. That is why the impulses have, tra have to travel only from one point, which is the AV node. Okay. Communication across this barrier under normal circumstances is possible only through the specialized conduction system formed by the AV node, the bundle of phase and the bundle branches and the ramifications. Okay. This is also clear. Now, the dominance of the left ventricle. So the ventricles, now if, uh, you saw the, that there is a biatrial chamber and there is a biventricular chamber. Now talking about the biventricular chamber, the ventricles consist of essentially three masses. There are basically three masses if you talk about the ventricles. First is the interventricular septum between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And then there are two free walls. One is the free wall of right ventricle, one is the free wall of left ventricle. Okay. The left ventricle is a dominant anatomical structure and is also the main hemodynamic pump of the heart. We all know this. LV is more dominant. It supplies blood to the entire body. RV is a very small unit. It supplies blood only to the right, only to the lungs. So that is why it is a smaller unit. That's why LV is more muscular, more powerful. RV is less muscular, less powerful. The interventricular septum consequently forms a continuum within the free wall of the left ventricle. So it is, it forms a continuum with left ventricle. The free wall of the right ventricle may be considered to be merely an appendage, which so to speak has been attached to the left ventricle. Okay. So right ventricle is so small and so insignificant that it sometimes it is not even supposed to be a separate chamber. It is just like an appendage, which is attached to the left ventricle, right? Like a side structure, which is attached to the left ventricle. Okay. Electrocardiographically and electrophysiologically too, the left ventricle including the interventricular septum is the dominant ventricle. Okay. The free wall of the right ventricle plays a, plays a relatively minor role. Okay. Furthermore, while the free wall of the right ventricle constitutes the anatomically anterior wall of the heart, right? So if you see the heart properly, the heart is not like he, left ventricle and right ventricle play side by side. If you see anterior posterior orientation, the right ventricle is towards slightly towards the anterior side and left ventricle is slightly towards the posterior side. Okay. So the right ventricle constitutes the anatomically anterior wall of the heart. The ECG anterior wall of the heart is in effect the interventricular septum. But like we said, the right ventricular free wall is so insignificant that it is the interventricular septum which actually forms the 
anterior wall of the heart if you talk ecg wise okay so for example if an anterior wall infarction happens it refers to the infarction of the interventricular septum and not the free wall when we say anterior wall infarction inferior wall infarction so when i talk about anterior wall infarction it is not the anterior wall is rv but it is we're not talking about rv there we're talking about the interventricular septum right so it should also be borne in mind that the electromagnetic forces generated by the free wall of the right ventricle are relatively minor compared to those generated by the free wall of the left ventricle hemodynamically also the right ventricle functions mainly as a conduit it is just a conduit it doesn't even contract much so blood is coming and going coming and going it is not doing anything much unlike lv which is actively contracting and pushing the blood to the entire body okay so i hope this is also clear see in this figure also you can see that the lv walls are so thick while the rv free in this is the lv wall this is the interventricular septum which is also very sick the rv wall is such a thin structure okay see in this figure also you can see the rv is a very uh, thin muscle while the lv is a very thick muscle okay so moving on to the next slide so what is the orientation of the conventional ecg leads okay so we have seen there 12 ecg leads conventionally how they orient so now everything comes to the left ventricle we've see right ventricle is not that important Atrial activity is denoted by P wave. The main thing what the ECG is used for is for the left ventricle. Okay. It tells us about the other structures also, but main thing is about the left ventricle. So if we talk about the orientation of the conventional ECG leads with respect to the left ventricle, the, the leads 2, 3 and AVF, they form the inferior leads. That is why any elevation, ST segment elevation here is termed as an inferior wall myocardial infarction. Lead 1 and AVL here, they form the high lateral leads. Okay, and V1 to V6, they are just the precordial leads out of which V5, V6 form the lateral leads, V3, V4 form the two anterior leads and V1, V2, they make the septal leads because they're towards the interventricular septum. Okay, talking about the AVR and V1, if you see AVR and V1, uh, they basically, uh, uh, they are basically oriented, they get impulses from, from the cavity of the heart. So, basically the since the once again okay so two three avf they form the inferior leads okay humne, uh, see humne pehli slides mein jab dekhe the, uh, limb leads ke axis orientations tab humne dekha tha, the two was going down and left so this is down and left right so towards here three was going down and right so this is down and right so towards this direction avf because it is placed in the uh, lower leaf lower limb left lower limb it is down so it is down right so that is why they form the inferior leads one uh humne dekha tha is going uh from left to right from right to left sorry so towards this direction horizontal so slide. So that is how one is here. So it forms the lateral AVL is in the, in the left upper limb. So that is also going slightly even above than that. So that is also forming the lateral lead. Okay. So this lateral hai, high lateral or you to chest me with precordial. So these are the anterior leads. Us may be, if you see anterior, maybe V5, V6 are towards the left side. So they form the lateral leads. V1, V2 are towards the right side. So they form the septal leads. Septum is on the right side. Na? And V3, V4 are true anterior leads. Okay. So this is clear and AVR and V1, they get impulses from the cavity of the heart. So, so now the impulses travel from endocardium to epicardium, right? From inside of the heart towards the outside wall of the heart. So that is why all of these leads, they show positive QRS mostly, except V1 and AVR where the QRS, in fact, all the majority of the impulses are negative. We will see that in further slides also, which, which ones are negative and which ones are positive. But remember AV and AVR and V1, the QRS complexes are at least negative in both of them. Okay. This is clear. Now, so this is the orientation of the limb leads. This slide is very important. If you want, you can screenshot it. Uh, it's the same thing is getting repeated once again. Lead one is horizontal. So if you form a, a, a circle of 360 degrees where this is zero, this is plus 90, this is plus 180, this is plus 270 or so called minus 90. And this is again 360 degree or zero degree. So if you see lead one is at zero degrees, lead two is at plus 60 degrees left and down, lead three is at plus 120 degrees right and down. Lead AVF is straight down, so it is at plus 90 degrees. Lead AVR, is, which is going towards the right upper limb, is at around uh, plus 210 degrees, which can also be called as minus 150 degrees. Okay? And lead AVL, which is at around uh, minus 30 degrees, also called plus 
if you go from here, it is plus 330 degrees or minus 30 degrees in simple terms. Okay. This is the orientation of the limb leads along, uh, uh, in the, with respect to the heart. This is important to understand. Yaad karne ki zarat nahi hai. Screenshot karlo. Baad mein padh lena. But samajna chahiye ki ye inka orientation aisa kaise hai. hai na? 2, 3 AVF kyo niche hai. 1 AVL kyo yaha pe hai. AVR kyo yaha pe hai. Exact kya numbers hai. Wo to tum screenshot karke baad mein padh sakto. That is not a big deal. Thik hai? So this is clear. Now the modes of atrial and uh, ventricular activation. Thik hai? How do the atrial and ventricular activation uh, wavefront proceeds? So... Remember that atria, see, we have seen that ventricles may uh, specialized conduction pathways. Hote hai, hai na? Bundle of his, Purkinje fibers, bundle branches, left bundle branch, right bundle branch, then Purkinje fibers. Hai? Ke se, the entire ventricle, it gets depolarized at the same time, right? Uh, Atria, mein, we saw that there are uh, anterior internodal tract, middle internodal tract, posterior internodal tract, but they are not that specialized. They do not conduct that fast. So the atrial muscles, they depolarize one after the other. So they depolarize by contiguity. The, the, the depolarization wavefront is slow in the atria. And it, it, the whole of both the atria, they don't depolarize at the same time. They take some time. While the ventricles, they, both of them, they, they depolarize at the same time, right? So the atrial uh, depolarization uh, uh, wave is longitudinal and it is by contiguity. The ventricular one, it is, it, is, it is transverse and synchronous. Now, what is the implication of this? How it makes any difference? So, the way it makes a difference is, if you see this figure, this is the atrial depolarization wavefront. This is the ventricular depolarization wavefront. This is point X and this is point Y. So, the atria is getting depolarized from point X to point Y in sequence. So, this cell will de get depolarized first, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. Okay. So, by the time this cell gets depolarized, this cell is already ready for next depolarization. So, the wavefront can again travel back through this point and can have a re-entry circuit. That is the significance of this. So, that is why atria are prone to have atrial fibrillation, which is a re-entry tachycardia. Atrial fibrillation has various mechanisms. We will see it in further classes. But one of the mechanisms is re-entry. So, because there is a sequential or which is called as out-of-phase activation. Yeah, Satvik, I'm telling it. So, basically, atrial depolarization is slow and it is in sequence, right? So, it depolarizes slowly. So, if the depolarization wavefront is growing from X to Y, this point is getting depolarized first. Then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. So by the time this point gets depolarized, this point is again ready for next cycle, for next depolarization, right? So this wavefront can travel back to point X and form a re-entry circuit, which is called as nothing but atrial fibrillation. That is why atrial fibrillation is a common occurrence. While what happens in ventricles is that the entire ventricular muscle mass gets depolarized at the same time. And then from epicardium, uh, from endocardium to epicardium, the waves travel, right? So that is why this is a longitudinal depolarization, while this is a transverse depolarization. It is going transverse from endocardium to epicardium. And this is in uh, synchronously, and this is contiguity. So that is why ventricular, so since all the cells are getting depolarized at the same time, by the time one cell gets ready for repolarization, all the cells are also again ready for repolarization. That is why it is an in-phase uh, activation. So that is why occurrence of re-entry circuit, chances of occurrence of re-entry circuit are less in the ventricles. That is why occurrence of ventricular fibrillation is less. That is why occurrence of atrial fibrillation is more common. Okay. Okay. So this is out of phase activation in atria versus in phase activation in ventricles. That is why chances of atrial fibrillation are more and ventricular fibrillation is less. Now, another implication of this is since all the vent, since it's a transverse, uh, this thing, depolarization, the electrical activity which we'll get of ventricular depolarization is the QRS wave. So the QRS wave wave will represent the entire ventricular mass. So if ventricular hypertrophy happens, it will be shown by the QRS complex. So that is why when we see the chamber enlargement uh, class, in that we will see the, QR, the changes in the QRS complex will tell you about left ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular hypertrophy because it is a transverse, this thing. It's, it's going transferly and all the cells are getting active at the same time. So it can tell you about the hypertrophy. It can tell you about the entire 
uh, muscle mass. While if it is a longitudinal uh, depolarization, one cell, second cell, third cell, fourth cell, fifth cell. So the wave which you'll get is not really composite of all the cells. It will give you all the cells in sequence. So that is why it cannot really tell you about the atrial hypertrophy. Only thing it can tell you if the atria gets enlarged, the, the time it will take for, to travel from the beginning to the end will be more. So it can tell you about the atrial enlargement, but not about the hypertrophy. So first of all, you need to know what is the difference between enlargement and hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is when a chamber walls become thick. The chamber is of the same size, but the walls are becoming thick. That is hypertrophy. Enlargement is when the walls are of the same thickness, but the chamber is becoming bigger. It is getting dilated. It is getting enlarged. That is enlargement. So everybody understood the difference between enlargement and hypertrophy. So because the ventricular activation sequence is transverse, it can tell us about the uh, hypertrophy. It can tell us about the so increase in cell size is cellular hypertrophy, Prithviraj. But we're talking about chamber hypertrophy. What is the chamber hypertrophy? Chamber hypertrophy is increased in the thickness of the uh, wall of the ventricle. Okay. So, uh, so uh, yeah. So when the left ventricle get hyper, gets hypertrophied or the right ventricle gets hypertrophied, it will be shown by the changes in the QRS complex. But atrial hypertrophy cannot be shown. Only atrial enlargement can be shown because if the atria is enlarged, it will take more time uh, for the impulse to travel from one place to another place. And only because since it's a sequential activation, it can only tell us about the enlargement, not the hypertrophy. Okay. I hope this is also clear. This is also slightly difficult to understand, but uh, I think I've made it pretty simple. So uh, I think it should not be very difficult. So once you know what is the difference between enlargement and hypertrophy, once you know how the activation sequence is in the atria and the ventricles, it should not be very difficult to understand why the atrial complexes will show only enlargement and the ventricular complexes will show hypertrophy. Okay. Now the genesis and representation of the uh, ECG deflections. Okay. So, first of all, if you talk about the P wave, P wave is pretty simple. We know atrial depolarization shows P waves. Okay? So, the genesis is genesis from SA node traveling to AV node, traveling through entire by both the atria gives us the P wave. Okay. Now, QRS is slightly difficult because it has three complexes Q, R, and S. And the activation sequence is also slightly complex. So, first of all, look at this slide. These are the potential forms of QRS deflections and the nomenclatures. So, QRS wave in different different leads and in different different patients and in different different pathologies can look different so if a qrs wave looks like this it is denoted as a small r and capital s because see always remember in a qrs wave the first negative deflection is going to be the q wave then the first positive deflection will be the r wave and the last phase of activation will be the s wave okay कई बार ऐसा हो सकता है कि पहला नेगेटिव आया ही नहीं डायरेक्ट पॉजिटिव आ गया कई बार हो सकता है कि पहला नेगेटिव आया फिर पॉजिटिव आया फिर कुछ भी सीक्वेंस हो सकता है ठीक है बट दिस इज टू बी रिमेंबर्ड दैट द फर्स्ट नेगेटिव वेव विल बी क्यू वेव क्यू वेव इज ऑलवेज नेगेटिव आर इज ऑलवेज पॉजिटिव ठीक है सो फर्स्ट नेगेटिव इज क्यू फर्स्ट पॉजिटिव इज आर एंड आफ्टर दैट कम्स वॉट एवर लास्ट एक्टिवेशन इज एस सो इन दिस पर्टिकुलर क्यू आर एस कॉम्प्लेक्स इफ यू सी देर इज नो नेगेटिव वेव फर्स्ट नेगेटिव वेव सो देर इज नो क्यू वेव हियर देर इज डायरेक्टली अ पॉजिटिव रिफ्लेक्शन विच इज स्मॉल एंड देन देर इज अज नेगेटिव रिफ्लेक्शन सो दैट वे दिस पॉजिटिव रिफ्लेक्शन इज द आर वेव दिस ह्यूज नेगेटिव रिफ्लेक्शन इज द एस वेव एंड दैट इज वाई दिस कॉम्प्लेक्स इज डिनोटेड एस स्मॉल आर कैपिटल एस सो दिस इज एन आर एस कॉम्प्लेक्स Okay, when the R wave is also equally big, S wave is also equally big, it will be denoted as a capital R, capital S complex. This is also clear. If the R wave is very big, S wave is small, it is a capital R, small S complex. If there is just one deflection, which is the positive deflection, it is an R wave. There is no Q wave, there is no S wave here. If there is a negative deflection first, which is the Q wave, which is small, and then a large positive deflection, which is R wave, which is large, and then last another negative deflection, which is small, it's a small Q capital R small s complex. This is also simple to understand. Now, if there's a large negative deflection, which is first, and a small positive deflection, it is a capital Q small r wave. If there is no positive deflection at all, then it is called as a QS wave because Q and S wave are merged. There's no R wave here. If there is an initial small positive deflection, then a large negative deflection, then again a small positive deflection, it is called as R S R dash wave. Small R capital S and small R dash. R dash or R prime, whatever you want to call it. It is called as R S R dash wave. If there is initial small positive deflection, 
then a small negative deflection, then a large positive deflection. It is called as small r, small s, r dash, okay, or capital R dash or R prime pattern. And if there is no negative wave, initial first small positive deflection, then a large positive deflection. Actually, both are large, but the second one is even larger. It is called as R, R dash pattern. Okay. So these are the patterns of uh, QRS complex. You don't need to remember them. They are pretty self-explanatory. But you need to remember this. Okay. Shouldn't, shouldn't it be only Q? So when there is a uh, when there is a negative single negative wave, it is called as a QS wave because the last activation so this suppose ki wo, jo dusra negative wave was merged, so it is called as a QS wave. It doesn't make any difference. We call it Q wave or QS wave. The nomenclature is it is called QS wave, so it doesn't matter, Anshaj. Okay, yeah. So now how the genesis of the QRS complex happens. So now this slide is very important. Understand. Does all QRS forms are specific to leads? No, Aftab. Not all forms are specific to leads. They can change. Some leads can show some forms. Other leads can show other forms. In different patients, also some leads can show some forms. Other leads can show other forms. In different pathologies, also some leads can show some forms. And other leads can show, show other forms. Not all of these forms are also physiological. Some of these forms are pathological. Like if you talk about this RSR dash pattern, this is seen in RBBB. So some of them can be pathological also, right? So when we see in the next classes, you'll try understand this. So some of these are physiological, some of these are pathological. So they can be seen in different, different leads, different, different patients, different, different pathologies. Okay. Yeah. So the genesis of the QRS complex. So uh, this slide is very important. Please try to understand it. So how does the QRS complex generate. So after the impulse has traveled from SA node to AV node, now it has to travel from the bundle of his and Perkins fibers. Okay. What is the time? It's 621. Okay. So this class might go a little longer than one hour. I hope everyone is okay with it. If you really want me to stop after one hour, please let me know. I'll stop. But I'll prefer to go because I would want to finish this topic today itself. So if you have to stop, if you have to stop, if you have to stop, if you have to Okay. So, uh, uh, basically when the wave comes from SA node to the AV node, then it has to travel through bundle of his and Perkins fibers. So the sequence of activation is such that first it depolarizes the, from the AV node, it comes to the interventricular septum. Okay. And then it travels from the interventricular septum to both the ventricles and the lateral walls, the free walls. Okay. Now remember when it travels from the, through the first, we'll see. So basically there are two phases. One is the septal activation phase and then is the free wall activation phase. So it comes from here, travels here. So this is the septal activation phase and then it goes to the free wall, both the free walls. That is the free wall activation phase. So basically there are two phases. That is why QRS comes, that is why QRS complex is two or three waves. So how they, those waves happen, we'll see that. So if you see the first phase of activation, which is the septal activation phase. So in this septal activation phase, there is a RV, so this interventricular septum is formed by RV also and LV also. So the septal activation wavefront also has two components. One is the RV component, which is traveling from right side to the left side, this component. And one is the LV component, which is traveling from the left side to the right side, this component. Now, as we all know that the LV is a very forceful and a heavy ventricle compared to the RV. So this vector obviously is going to be the stronger vector. So that is why the resultant vector is a left to right. So stop the class after one hour because we already attended for YouTube session. So we are saturated. Okay. So somebody wants me to stop after one hour. No problem. I'll, I still have seven more minutes to go. So I'll just, uh, I think we started also 10 minutes late. So, uh, I think we'll go for another 15 minutes or so if that's okay. Yeah. So the resultant vector is a left to right, uh, uh, vector. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. So if you see the left, the left, this vector is stronger than this vector. So the resultant vector is this. So whatever complexes we're getting will be of this vector. Okay. Then comes the free wall activation in free wall activation. The LV activation goes in this direction and then through this direction. So it is left to right in the LV free wall activation and right to left. Uh, sorry, right to left in the LV free wall activation and left to right in the RV free wall activation. And obviously we know this is less strong than this. So this will be represented more. So all in all the septal and uh, it, it must be emphasized that since electrical activity usually occurs synchronously in more than one region of the heart, the ECG at any given moment senses and reflects the net or resultant force or vector that reflects the resultant electrical activity of what may be several synchronous electrical vectors traveling in different directions. So, at one time, 
मैं बता रहा हूँ मैं बता रहा हूँ नसीहा जा सैम टेलिंग सो एक टाइम पे जितने भी एक्टिवेशन होंगे उन सब का रिजल्टेंट वैक्टर हमें ई में दिखेगा तो क्योंकि ये वेक्टर एक्टिवेशन और ये वेक्टर एक्टिवेशन एक ही टाइम पे हो रहे हैं तो इनका जो रिजल्टेंट वेक्टर होगा उनका रिजल्टेंट वेक्टर इसी डायरेक्शन में होगा क्योंकि ये ज्यादा स्ट्रॉन्ग वेक्टर है तो हमें इस डायरेक्शन में डिपोलराइजेशन मिलेगा तो फेज वन में हमें सो इन ओके सो इन फेज वन या ओके सो सो समी वॉन्ट्स मी टू स्पीक ओनली इन इंग्लिश सो एट वन पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम इफ देर आर two or three depolarizations or vectors happening so the resultant which we'll see on the ecg is going to be the resultant of all of those vectors theek hai so if this and this are happening at the same time the resultant vector will be one of this because this is a stronger one and similarly if this and this are happening at the same time the resultant which we'll see will be in this direction because this is the stronger one okay clear so in the septal activation phase the resultant will be left to right and in the free wall activation phase the resultant trend will be right to left i hope this is clear somebody please put it in the chat box if this is clear or not if not i'll explain it again because this is really important to understand because the next slides will be dependent on this slide okay nasiha jasis it's clear fine now next next i am going to ask you people something so uh since this is clear now now we know that v5 v6 are left sided leads sirish we want me to repeat it one more time i'll repeat it in short because a lot of people and we are already short on time so so the uh, first first activation phase in the ventricle is the septal activation the second phase is the free wall activation in septal activation the rv vector is in this direction the lv vector is in this direction so the resultant will be always lv because lv is dominant so the resultant will be in this direction similarly in free wall activation the rv vector is in this direction and the lv vector is in this direction so the resultant will be in this direction because lv is dominant so resultant is that in the septal activation phase the resultant is in le left to right, right direction and in the free wall activation the resultant is in right to left direction theek hai this is clear now it is clear na can't be simpler than this it is already very simple okay so now i have to ask you one question now i have to ask you one question so what is the effect of this particular phenomena on a left oriented lead and what is the effect of this particular phenomena on a right oriented lead okay so humne sab kuch we have understood everything we have understood that from all the information which we have got till now you tell me that there is a left oriented lead which is v5 or v6 and there is a right oriented lead which is v1 or v2 okay now how will this phenomena reflect in those leads so these are the qrs activation complexes okay which of these you will see in a uh, in v6 and which of these you will see in v1 can somebody please tell it to me i'll be really happy if somebody answers it please put it in the chat box whether you will see what sort of capital r or small r or capital s or small s you will see in v6 and in v1 can somebody tell okay v1 will have a tall r correct manoj singh you are right v1 will have a tall r and a no 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 you are wrong <laughs> you are wrong so v1 will have a so what is happening is okay let let other people guess more no manoj singh you are not right you are wrong more 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 answers please small r capital s in v1 correct manohar reddy you're right v1 small r and long s correct ariba khan you're also right okay and v6 v6 capital r and small s and v6 correct Again, man, who are ready? You're right. So everybody's got it. Everybody's understood it. I'm happy now that people are understanding it. Okay, good. So yeah. So in V1, you'll have a small R and a deep S, right? Because septal phase active one activation is going to be small R here, and then a deep S here. And again, similarly in V6, it's going to be a small R. This is going to be a small wave. So it's going to be small Q and then a capital R, a large R. 
S. So basically, you're confusing capital R, small things, capital R, small s, but it's going to be a small Q and capital R because first one is going to be the sector, septal one, no? So it's going to be a small Q and then a capital. This is going to be capital R. Okay. So yeah. But anyway, everyone did good. Yeah. So I am really glad everyone is understanding whatever I'm saying. So this is how it happens, right? So that is why in a normal ECG, you get a small R and a capital S and a deep S capital S in lead V1 and a small Q and a capital R or a tall R in V6. So now we know how it happens, what the normal ECG looks like. Okay. Now the transition zone, transition zone is V3, V4. So this deep, tall, deep S and tall R. Now somewhere in between it has to transition. No. So the transition will happen at around V3, V4 normally. So in V3, V4, the slowly, slowly the S will start becoming smaller and the R will start becoming bigger. And by V3, V4, it will be uh, tall R and, and small S. Okay. So that is a transition zone. Okay, good. Now AVR and V1. Since lead, uh, it's 6.30. So I'll just take 10 more minutes. Since lead AVR is directed towards the cavity of the heart, which we've already seen, all the vectors, both atrial and ventricular, are directed away from this lead, which will consequently normally reflect all negative deflections. That is why all the deflections are negative in lead AVR, because lead AVR is seen from, from inside the heart. So it is all the deflections are negative. P wave is negative, QRS is negative, and T wave all will be negative. Okay. The only vectors that are directed towards lead V1. Now, if you talk about lead V1, the direct, uh, vector which is directed to a V1 is the first atrial vector. That is why it will give a positive P wave and the resultant septal vector. The septal vector, which is the small initial R wave is also positive here. So that is why in lead V1, you'll get a positive P wave. You'll get a small positive R wave and then there'll be a big negative S wave and then T wave will also be negative. So in V1, only P wave and R wave are positive and then it's all negative and AVR, everything is negative. Okay. Thus abnormality should not be read into leads AVR or V1 unless these leads reflect abnormal positivity. If these uh, waves become positive, they are abnormal. Negative ones are not, not abnormal. Okay. Now RV and LV leads. So in the past, a concept existed and occasionally even exists today that a precordial lead for example, a right oriented lead like a V1 represents the electrical forces generated by the right ventricle immediately subjacent to the electrode, the so-called ventricular pickup or local pickup effect. Okay. So previously there used to be this concept that V1, V2 are right ventricular leads and V5, V6 are left ventricular leads. However, it must be stated with great emphasis that it is a complete misconception. The electrode oriented to a region of the heart senses and transmits the resultant vector of many synchronous and instantaneous electrocardiographic forces, which are generated from many regions of the heart. So after reading so much, after understanding so much, we have understood that even V1 will tell you about the septal activation also, LV free wall activation also, RV free wall activation also, it will tell you a composite of everything, right? So this is a complete misconception that V1 is a right ventricular lead and V6 is a left ventricular lead. This is, now we have understood this, we have understood in great detail. We can even explain it to, if you want you can explain it to anyone right it is not that v1 is our right ventricle and v6 is left ventricle that is a complete misconception it should therefore be understood the terms right ventricle and left ventricle leads refer to only lead orientation and do not represent the forces generated immediately below the electrode every lead will tell you about the entire forces of the heart it's not key. one lead is telling about one one particular portion of the heart okay uh, yeah so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad everyone is understanding well that now the T wave and the SC segment, these are pretty simple. The T wave is normally inscribed in the same direction as the QRS complex. So in whichever lead QRS complex is going to be positive, T wave will be positive. In whichever lead QRS complex is negative, like AVR and V1, T wave will also be negative. It has asymmetric limbs, the proximal limb being shallower and the distal limb uh, is more deep. Okay, not much of a point. We'll see that in, when we see the ECG later. It has a relatively blunt apex on other. The ST segment represents the greater part of the ventricular repolarization. Okay. So the ST segment and the T wave, they together make the ventricular repolarization. So it leaves the baseline almost immediately after its origin from the end of the QRS complex. There's very little or none of it tends to be isoelectric. The ST segment usually merges smoothly and imperceptibly with the proximal limb of the T wave so that it is difficult to separate them. Now the U wave, the U wave is a small uh, rounded deflection that occurs immediately after the T wave. It is normally in the same direction as the T wave. It is usually best seen in leads V2 to V4. The reflection may be so small to make accurate recognition dif uh, difficult. So, so usually U wave is not even mentioned in the ECG reporting, but it becomes prominent in hypokalemia. If you're seeing a very prominent U wave, you should suspect 
hypokalemia low potassium okay now rotation of the heart this will take next 5 to 10 minutes and this is the last concept which we are going to discuss today so let everybody pay attention this is also slightly more difficult to understand because it's a slightly advanced concept just last 5 minutes give me yours and then i'll uh, leave all of you so for many years the concept prevailed that the heart was subject to anatomical position changes and that these could be reflected electrocardiographically okay so previously it was supposed ki heart moves anatomically heart will move to the left and to the right and these changes will reflect on the ecg these so called anatomical changes were thought to uh, bring about a change in the direction of the electrical forces of the heart so that various ecg patterns in different groups of electrocardiographic leads could reflect the surface to which they were oriented and thereby reflect various cardiac potential changes so it was thought that because the heart is moving everywhere that is why ecg changes are happening however it is very doubtful whether true anatomical movement does indeed occur so heart usually does not move heart will stay there only but if so it is indeed very minimal even if it moves it moves very little so the various so called anatomical positions rather uh, uh, reflect the differences in the electrical emphasis or direction so the changes which we see in ecg whenever a pathology happens it is not because of because the heart is moving around it is because the electrical axis of the heart is moving okay that is why we are seeing those changes for example the so called horizontal heart position is really an expression of the left qrs axis deviation right so if so sometimes you think the heart is like this right so heart has become horizontal that is why you are getting left axis deviation but that is not the heart has not become horizontal it is the qrs axis which has become horizontal and so called vertical heart has become vertical like this so that is right axis deviation it is the electrical axis which has become right side not the heart okay nevertheless an understanding of the so called hypothetical anatomical conception of cardiac position facilitates the understanding of potentially differing electrical uh, emphasis right so even though that is a wrong uh, notion that the heart moves but if you understand it like that it will let you understand the uh, axis changes better so axis rotations and all we will see in detail in next class but i will uh, uh, slow uh, like in a small detail i would want to touch the concept so that you understand it and then we can uh, furnish it later in the next class okay so thus while the terms clockwise and counter clockwise clockwise rotation as well as vertical and horizontal heart positions are still in use they should be viewed as differences in the electrical emphasis or electrical distribution and direction rather than anatomical changes in position the heart was theoretically thought to rotate around two hypothetical axes the anteroposterior axis and the oblique or longitudinal axis i'll explain these axes so rotation around the anteroposterior axis reflects rotation in the frontal plane right so we've seen the frontal plane and the horizontal plane so if the heart is rotating around the anteroposterior axis it is rotating in the frontal plane so that will give rise to axis changes left axis or right axis and rotation around the oblique or longitudinal axis reflects rotation in the horizontal plane so that will gives right to the clockwise or counter clockwise rotation we'll see these things so let's let's first see the rotation around the, no, just five more minutes rotation around the anteroposterior axis so normal heart lies somewhat so if this is my chest the normal heart lies somewhat like this if the heart rotates in this direction okay or if the heart rotates in this direction this is the rotation in the anteroposterior axis okay so if the heart goes up like this okay this is what we call as the left axis deviation this is what we call as the right axis deviation so if you think like this if the heart is going up like this okay so the leads which are here the one and the avl leads they will have a positive uh, r wave a large positive r wave and the inferior leads the avf lead will have a large negative s wave correct this is understood because the heart has moved in its direction so now it will have a positive r wave this will have a positive s wave because see if you see the the phase 2 which is the prominent phase will give a positive r wave here and a prominent negative s wave here opposite to this is here if the heart moves like this it becomes a vertical heart this is a horizontal heart this is a vertical heart the heart becomes like this towards the right side so what will happen is the avf avf will be get a positive r wave here the avf had a negative s wave and uh, the avl will have a negative s wave more commonly so this is nothing but the left axis deviation this is nothing but the right axis deviation by mnemonic you can remember as left leaves so one and avl they come together so you can either say avl or one or you can either say uh, a, and this is the avf wave right so in left axis deviation there is a tall r wave in lead 1 uh, or avl and deep s in uh, avf and in right axis deviation there is a tall r in avf 
and deep S in AVL. Okay. So this is represented by the mnemonic left leaves and right reaches. So if you see these two are, they're supposed to be leaving from each other, right? This is going up, this is going down. So they're leaving from each other. So left leaves. And here it is, uh, here S, I don't know, it, uh, it is not given in this figure. I don't know why. So if AVL is, has prominent S wave and this is has prominent R wave, they are reaching each other. So in right, they reach each other. So right reaches and left leaves. I hope that is also clear. Okay. So this was about the axis deviation and the anteroposterior axis. Now, rotation around the oblique axis. So if you see around the oblique axis, if this is, if you cut the, uh, cut open the uh, apex of the heart, this is the interventricular septum. This is the anterior chest wall. Okay. This is a chest wall like this. Okay. Chest wall circle. So this is the interventricular septum. This is the RV free wall. This is the LV free wall. Okay. So normally the RV is slightly in the front. We know. Okay. So now if you see rotation in the counterclockwise direction, so if the heart becomes rotates in the counterclockwise direction, right? So what happens is counterclockwise rotation, one second, counterclockwise rotation would allegedly bring the LV into a more anterior position. So LV will come into the anterior position in the counterclockwise position in the counterclockwise rotation. Okay. When this occurred, the leads V1 and V2 would be oriented to the right ventricle and consequently record small R and deep S. Okay. If, if that were oriented towards the right, they'll give a small R and deep S. Whereas V4, V5, V6 would be oriented to the left ventricle and they will record a small Q and capital R complexes. Okay. So here you'll get a small R deep S in V1 and small Q and capital R in V6. Okay. So this is a counterclockwise rotation. In other words, there's a shift of the transition zone to the patient's right or the reader's left. So patient's right is like towards the V2. So if you see here the deep S in V2 itself, the R wave has started becoming so tall. So the transition zone has shifted to V2. Normally the transition zone is at V3 or V4. If the transition zone has shifted to V2, it is a counterclockwise rotation. Exactly opposite to this is with clockwise rotation around the oblique axis, the R wave was thought to assume a more anterior position so that the interventricular septum uh, lay parallel to the anterior chest wall. So normally the interventricular septum is perpendicular to the anterior chest wall. If, if it is a clockwise rotation, now what is happening is the RV is assuming a more anterior position. Interventricular septum has become horizontal, parallel to the chest wall, right? Here you can see, okay? LV has become more posterior, RV has become more anterior. So this, will move, this would mean now all the chest leads, leads V1 to V5 or sometimes even V6 would reflect the RV potential, which is small R capital S, small, uh, small R capital S, deep S, right? So most of them, sometimes the lead V6 probably can show a good R wave also, depending on the magnitude of rotation. In other words, there's a shift of the transition zone to the patient's left or the reader's right. So that the transition complex is now at V5 or V6. So all of most of the leads have prominent S wave. Only V5 has started showing, uh, sometimes even V6 may show, v, even V5 may not show has started showing R wave. So the, the transition zone has shifted towards the reader's right or the patient's left. Okay. So that is the clockwise rotation. So now I also wanted to cover intrinsic and intrinsic or deflection. Uh, now it's entirely dependent on you guys. I hope rotation you've understood. Okay. Harinath Bhama says it's enough. Okay. Rotation you've understood. Intrinsic and intrinsic or deflection. Maybe we can see in the next class if possible. Otherwise, we'll just leave this topic. And uh, yeah, so this is what a normal ECG looks like, whatever we have read in today's class. Okay, AVR has all the waves negative, negative P, negative QRS, negative T, V1 has ne negative S complex mainly, but P wave is positive and uh, T wave is also negative because T wave goes with QRS. Rest, if you see there's a positive uh, tall R wave, small Q tall R in V6. Okay. And uh, this is the normal axis of the heart where AVF is also positive. One is positive, two is positive, three is positive. AVL is also almost positive and AVR is negative. This is the normal axis of the heart. Okay. We will see the normal ECG again in detail in next class, but this is about it. So yeah, this is everything today. I think all of you are saturated. Did you guys attend any other class before this? How did you get saturated in just one hour? Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, Dr. Ajit, are you still there? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm here in the class. Okay, so, so guys, I do you have any questions? 
yeah if any questions i tried to address your questions saath saath mein whenever you were saying it so ah uh, no perfectly ho gaya hai sir yes if the patient is dextrocardic does the chest and lead positioning change so uh, uh, manohar reddy we will see those things in next class okay uh, yeah. what happens in dextrocardia what happens in those changes we'll see all of those things today we were we i mainly wanted to talk about ki how are these waves originated what is the physiology behind behind it what how the electrical changes are happening and everything so this pathology is on all we'll see later so i I did not want to bombard you with a lot of uh, 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 things to memorize. I just wanted you to understand ki how things happen, and um, I was glad that all of you were answering well. So that makes me happy that I'm able to explain it well. And uh, yeah, so any other question, please. Absolutely. If any question, guys, please suit up. Uh, I think Dr. Bhatia, no questions. We can wind up. Yeah. So thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Vadia. Thank you, everyone. For I joining. think I think intrinsic or deflection is the only topic which we left today. If we have time, we'll do it. So we'll do it next time. Uh, yes. Uh, it would have taken just five more minutes, but I think all of you are very saturated now. It's a Sunday evening, so let's just leave it now. Uh, let's okay. let's let's take it next week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care.